Welcome to Line Change, a podcast about hockey, social issues, and change makers in the game we love. I'm your host, Ian Kennedy. Welcome to Line Change. I'm your host, Ian Kennedy, and today we have an amazing double dose for you. We're talking to Boston Pride forward Lauren Gable, the PHF's MVP, as well as Boston Pride defender Callie Flanagan, the best defender in the league this season, and a former Olympian and World Championship gold medalist with Team USA. I'm Ian Kennedy, and this is a Line Change. Thanks for joining me, Callie, and uh, we're going to talk about the Boston Pride and the PHF today, as well as uh, women's hockey in general and some other things that are going on uh, in the world of hockey. But uh, I first want to thank you and uh, just first ask you, I guess, about the uh, another incredible season for the Boston Pride. Uh, first place overall in the regular season. I know the playoffs didn't go well, but uh, maybe you can uh, give us your thoughts on the season. Yeah, this season was awesome. Um, like you said, obviously we had an awesome regular season. Um, you know, to be able to bring home the regular season title was awesome. Um, we had a lot of fun winning a lot of games. Um, but yeah, just at the end there, we had a little bit of a struggle. Um, and so I think for, for all of us at the Boston Pride, we're excited to already get next season going and, you know, kind of try to bring that Isabel Cup back home. And we, we just had one of your teammates announce, Lauren Gable, as the PHF MVP what what makes Lauren a special player and, and what do you think that means to her and to the Boston Pride organization to have that recognition? Yeah, Lauren is great. I mean, obviously you guys watched her all year and she collected a lot of a lot of awards in the postseason. Um, all of them are so deserving. Um, she's a great player, a great person, um, and she's a great teammate. And she's honestly just a lot of fun to play with. And I'm really happy she's on my team, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, she's so deserving. She just really sees the ice honestly like nobody else she has this gift this vision um and her shot is like literally unlike anyone else's i've ever seen in the women's game um and so yeah like i said it's really fun to play with her and a lot of fun to be her teammate and i know she's really happy and proud to you know play for the boston pride as well yeah i'd watched lauren on tv a few times and streaming and things like that and i hadn't got to see her live in person until the phf all-star game this year in toronto and uh, she definitely put on a great show there along with a lot of the other women that were at that event. Uh, I think it was kind of a coming out party for uh, so so many people in that league, you know, whether it was Fanny Gasparix from Team World or, or whatever it might have been. It was really an impressive display and uh, I think introduced a lot of people to names that they should be knowing in the PHF. Um, and I think one of the more exciting things that's been happening in the last couple of weeks is as PHF uh, free agency opened up, we've seen some brand new names coming into the league. Um, one of the, the the names that's come out there with the Boston Pride attached to it, of course, is Alina Mueller, who is one of the best in the world. Uh, I got a chance to watch her at the World Championships recently with Switzerland. Just an elite talent. And from someone with your experience coming through you know, the national team programs, uh, the NCAA through to the PWHPA and now in the PHF. What do you think it means to the PHF in general to get some of these really top end talents, not just in the NCAA, but in the world, uh, beginning to pay attention to the league and to, to make that the league of choice? Yeah, I think it's great. I think Reagan Carey's done a great job. Um, if anyone's going to you know, drive the boat, it's going to be her. Um, she just <laughs> takes charge and, you know, she really knows how to get things done. And so I think our league is really moving in the right direction. And it's really exciting. Obviously, the salary cap doubled for next year. Um, and so I think a lot of players are looking that looking at that and being like, wow, this is like becoming a really legit league. Um, and so I think, again, like you said, having this top end talent come into our league is huge. Um, it's only going to make it more competitive, more fun um, for all the players. And I think hopefully the hope is that we'll attract more sponsors, more dollars into the league um, and things like that. And, and just hopefully, hopefully continue to trend in an upward direction. I know I've said it a bunch of times. We've, we just launched the, the hockey news is women's uh, hockey website. And I think it, everyone kind of is recognizing now that we are at this ground floor 
spot in women's sport where the growth is exponential, the opportunities for fans, for, for sponsorship, for, for media rights and coverage is just going up and up. And it's really an exciting time to be a part of that and to watch it happening. And the PHF, I think, is a prime example of where we see that. And of course, you know, I think that the, the PWHPA, if they get their league going, will have some of that to be in that conversation as well, of course. But for now, the PHF is the focus. And uh, one of the things that I really appreciated this year about watching professional women's hockey and is the pride, not just the Boston pride, but I wanted to ask you about pride because this show, we talk about social issues a lot as well as women's hockey and other issues in the game. Um, but pride became this really contentious, divisive topic in the NHL and we saw players sitting out we saw so much commentary going on about uh, support of the LGBTQ plus community which really kind of goes counterintuitive to all of the messages of diversity and inclusion that we're seeing in the game but that didn't happen in the PHF and I know the Boston Pride wore those Pride jerseys um, proudly and you know really were representative I hope that you can maybe express your thoughts on this, uh, you know, and kind of what you think about it and why you think the league and your team uh, really bought into to showing that support. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, the concept of pride is so important. And, you know, I'm really proud to be a part of the PHF because of the, because of the way that we've displayed, you know, inclusivity in our league. And so I think it's really important and, and my belief has always been and always will be that everyone's in, uh, welcome in hockey, um, no matter who you are and who you love. And so I think, you know, for our sport, it's really important that we continue to show, um, you know, prospective players, athletes, whether that's athletes, staff, um, anyone that's involved in any of our organizations, not only to them, but also to, you know, our fans. And there are so many young people who look up to us as role models. And so it's so important that we let everyone know, like I said, including our fans and especially our fans that, you know, everyone's welcome at our games. Everyone's welcome in this league. Um, and we just want to make sure that everyone feels supported and welcomed and, you know, safe and Again, I'm just really proud of the way that, you know, the PHF has handled it and, and, you know, put on that display of support for the LGBTQ plus community. It really was, I guess, kind of, I don't know, it felt good to watch that happening. And I know that, uh, you know, there's far more openly gay uh, women playing professional hockey than there are openly gay men playing professional hockey, because right now, other than Luke Prokop, there's really not... Um, too many out men in the sport of hockey. And that's something obviously we hope changes over time because we do want everyone to feel completely comfortable in the dressing room and on the ice and, and not to hear those slurs and uh, those other items. But it is a portion of opening doors for other people. And I think that the PHF and the Boston Pride were great examples of that this season myself. But one other door that you've opened and something else that you personally have kind of broken through in is you became a historic, I guess, in the USPHL um, coach with the Northern Cyclones. You became the first woman um, to serve in a coaching role there. Maybe you can tell me and anybody that's not aware about your role there and how that came to be. Yeah, so my dad owns the Northern Cyclones. Um, it's an organization up in Hudson, New Hampshire. We have, um, you know, youth teams, um, academy teams, which is U, uh, U18 and under. Uh, and then we have junior programs as well. And so um, when I graduated from college, my dad kind of was just like, you know, why don't, like, do you want to get into coaching? Um, why don't we coach together? Like, why don't you coach with me? Um, and I kind of, again, because I grew up, you know, around boys, playing boys, I've been like, my whole life. And so it kind of just wasn't a second thought for me. Um, our NCDC team is our top tier uh, junior team that we have in our program. Um, it's in the NCDC, which is tier two, similar to the NAL. Um, and so, yeah, I just, again, I never felt like I was different. I never felt like, um, you know, I was out of place because I was a girl coaching. Um, all the guys that I've coached have been awesome. They're great kids and have made me feel, you know, comfortable and welcomed. And obviously it's nice to have my dad there, um, you know, lead the way and, and, you know, get my feet wet coaching. But um, yeah, it's been awesome. Like you said, I was the first female um, to coach the USPHL has also been nothing but amazing towards me and supportive. Um, and I've just had a lot of fun with it, especially my first couple of years, kind of just like figuring it out. And then the last, I think this was my fourth season this past year. So the third and fourth year kind of found my voice a little bit more and 
really, um, you know, like I said, got into it and had a lot of fun. And we've had a lot of good teams. And so it's been awesome so far. Yeah, I saw a clip too of uh, you skating with the team as well and getting the extra ice time there, which I think is pretty cool that you can do that. But uh, one of the, the items that I found, and I know it's not bizarre because it's so prevalent, but when I was at the World Championships in Brampton, there was only one woman as the head coach of a team there, and that was Carla McLeod with Czechia. Uh, and she was fabulous. I mean, it was uh, media was just flocking to her because she was such a great speaker and so motivational. And the way that her team spoke about her was you could tell that they would, you know, if, if she said, go and turn and skate through that wall, uh, they would. Yeah. And they would probably do it with a smile and be happy to try and do that. Uh, now, she would never ask them to do something like that because it seemed like, I don't know, it, it was almost like she was the Ted Lasso of women's hockey coaching and it just she just brought this energy and these quirky sayings and uh but everyone loved what she was doing and the way that the team reacted to that i think was really special but yourself i mean did you have a lot of women as coaches growing up um and what do you think the importance of having women in those roles is in hockey. Yeah, so growing up, I actually didn't have a lot of female coaches. In high school, I had, um, our head coach was a, a man. Um, however, in college, I was fortunate enough to go to BC. Um, and so our two coaches there are Katie King Crowley and Cor Kennedy. Um, and so they're both former Olympians for the US national team. So I feel so fortunate to have been able to play for them. Um, they were both amazing coaches and I absolutely loved my time at Boston College. And so being able to play hockey there, um, you know, under them and grow under them as not only a hockey player, hockey player but also as a person um was awesome they obviously have great advice and are really wise in their you know hockey hockey and person um you know abilities and so i think for me i feel really lucky that i had them um but yeah i think it's really important i think you know i think there's kind of a little bit of a changing of the tides here with our generation of women's hockey that's coming through i think a lot of a lot of more girls are getting involved in coaching um i think it's really important you know and i think for me again being on the bench with the boys i think it's cool for me because I'm, you know, out there and I'm thinking to myself, like maybe another little girl's going to see me on the bench and, and be like, wow, maybe I could do that one day. Um, and so I think that's really important that, you know, we're out there and we're coaching and we're getting involved in the game, helping grow the game in any way that we can. Um, again, just like I said, because I think that we're such, you know, role models for these younger people and, and they need to see it to be it and or believe that they can be it. And so I think, you know, being able to be out there and be visible and be seen, I think it, it goes a long way. Yeah, it's not just in women's hockey too. Obviously, having people like yourself that are coaching men's hockey uh, is really important as well because it's not like uh, there's an there's an abundance of talented, intelligent women uh, that could be stepping over and coaching men's hockey. I mean, I always look at the the people that the NHL hires, and uh, you listen to their post game discussions, and uh, it's not very articulate. Um, it's you know we got to do good and they did good. And it's, it just, it's, it's not the, you know, but, but women's hockey is different because almost everybody is coming to this with a university degree and some with a master's degree and some with a doctorate. And it, it's like really educated, well-spoken, intelligent people that understand the game of hockey in a really in-depth way as well. And there's so many aspects of women's hockey that should be transferred over to men's hockey. Obviously, you know, the body contact versus body checking is always a big debate, but if, uh, you know, if, if men learned how to angle and use their bodies the way that women did, they would be much more effective defensively. Uh, to be honest, it's, I don't think that there's too much debate in that instead of just, you know, running at people and trying to, to crush them. It, it, there's a really effective checking method that, uh, is taught in women's hockey that's not taught in men's. So that's that's something there. And, and um, you know, you've been through pretty much every level of women's hockey right now, whether it was Boston College, uh, and then, you know, you made the, the U.S. national team and you won an Olympic gold medal and a world championship gold medal. Um, and then, of course, you know, you, you didn't make the, the 2022 team. Um, you'd been playing in the PWHPA. And then you jumped to the PHF. And this seems to be 
you know, there's a little bit of a trend going on right now where I think we're seeing a shift happening, as we talked about earlier, where more people are looking at the PHF as the league of choice. Um, and right now, of course, it's the only option and that could change. But for the moment being, that's this is what we're talking about. So but I'm wondering for you personally, having been through NCAA national team, PWHPA, what was the decision making process like for you? Because obviously that's a pretty emotional roller coaster of of making teams and not making teams. And I, I talked to to Lauren Gable about this as well because she kind of went through a similar pathway with the uh, the Canadian national team. Um, so I'm wondering what your thought process was and what what led you to this position you're in now? Yeah. So obviously, like you said, I didn't make the 2022 Olympic team, um, and so I was in residency. Uh, I was released around, uh, I think it was like the end of November of that year. Um, and so honestly, when I got home, my immediate thought was I need to join the Boston Pride. Um, I don't know what clicked, um, but it kind of just was like an immediate, it was like my instinct was like, I want to play hockey. I want to play games. I want to be part of a team, um, have a real schedule, play real games um, and play for something. Um, and then also I have a connection to my head coach as well, uh, Paul Mara. He was my assistant defenseman uh, coach at the Olympics in 2018. So there was a real familiarity there with him, um, and he's a great coach. Um, we obviously have won uh, some, champ some championships together, and so for me, um, it kind of was a no-brainer. Um, I talked to him right when I got home, um, and he kind of just made me feel comfortable about the decision. Um, and yeah, the girls were uh, so awesome to me, so welcoming. Um, and like I said, it kind of was a no-brainer. Um, I had been a part of the PWHPA, but for me, you know, like I said, I wanted to play, play for something, play for a team. Um, I'm from Boston. I grew up in Boston, went to Boston College. Um, so like I said, it was kind of just a no-brainer for me. And I'm really happy I made the switch. I'm really proud to be in the PHF, really proud to play for the Boston Pride um, and for our coach, Paul Mara. Um, and it's been a lot of fun so far for me. Yeah, it seems like the Boston Pride have a really great fan base at Warrior as well. It, you know, it looks like it's one of the most full buildings in the league every night. Um, and Boston itself, I think we've seen it with some of these discussions of new players coming in. Um, it's a pretty unique city in terms of the, the hockey talent that is there. Um, you know, the bean pot, I guess we'll call it that, that crew of the, the city champions, whether it's Northeastern, which is of course where we're getting the people like, uh, Alina Mueller and Chloe Aurora that are going to step into the league. And, and, um, but there's so many, um, what, what was that environment like for you, um, you know, getting to compete in that event with so many great hockey programs in one spot. Yeah, the Bean Pot is so much fun. I think when you grow up as a Boston kid, you always watch the Bean Pot, um, whether that be the men or the women. Um, and so I think for me, you know, being able to play in the Bean Pot, and I won a couple of Bean Pot championships as well with my teammates at BC. And so I think for me, being able to play in that tournament was just so much fun. And it's kind of the epitome of Boston hockey. Um, you know, you get to walk around with the pride of Boston's best hockey team. And so it's a lot of fun. And like you said, there's just so many great players that come out of those Boston schools. And so it's always a fiery battle to play in that. Um, and it's just so much fun. It's awesome. One of the exciting points that I got, uh, I read recently was that the bean pot's actually going to move the women's side to the TD garden now, which yeah. is uh, obviously fantastic because I think that shows what we've been talking about, that there's everyone's recognizing the growth and they're seeing that they need the big venue to host the, the crowds that are going to come for women's hockey now. And that's, that's definitely something. Um, what I I know that you've seen that throughout the NCAA. What kind of fan base do you think is there for women's hockey? Yeah, I think like you said, I think it's the, the growth is exponential, and so I think kind of just going back to you know our Boston Pride games at Warrior. I think we've you know we do our our staff does a great job, and they sell all, almost I would say almost all of our Saturday games are sellouts. Um, the crowds are great. Um, a lot of youth teams come in, a lot of families, um, but. It's been awesome. Like again, playing playing in Boston is so much fun. But I think again, c women's hockey in general. I think the fan base is only growing, um, and I think that the more that you know we put it out there for people to see, the more visibility that we're afforded, um, the mo only more it's going to grow. And so I think being able to have the bean pot at the Garden, um, and you know just have that advertising the same as the men, and have it be you know out there on TD Garden on the wall when you're coming across the bridge in Boston, um, is just humongous. Because again, like I said, its visibility is is you know, what we've been fighting for this whole time. And, and I think that's what we truly need the most of. Um, and that's, what's going to like really help push our sport forward. And so again, just being able to get that visibility and, and continue to grow that fan base. I think, like you said, the growth is just, you know, the sky's the limit, honestly. 
Yeah, it, it has been a fight, obviously. Even when you joined the national team, that was the the season that there was talk about them boycotting the the world championships for more pay. And, and you know, that's come a long way with the national programs. The PHF's come a, a tremendous. I mean, just the fact that you can double a salary cap from one point to, you know, one point to one point five million dollars from seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in one season is pretty uh incredible and i know the league has grown to montreal and toronto recently um okay i'm gonna put you on the spot if there was another uh phf expansion team where have you played that you would love to play in again as a, another another city that you could go back to let's say like as long as i get to play for boston because i'm not leaving boston of course yeah you're you're playing yeah, yeah. for boston but you're a visiting team yeah. somewhere else um that's a good question. I think somewhere in the Midwest could be fun. Um, obviously, we always have fun on the West Coast, but I think Midwest, the fans in the Midwest are great. Um, Chicago could be cool. Um, you know, there's plenty of rumors swirling around that. And so I think, I don't know, just adding maybe something in the Midwest or obviously it's always fun to go up to Canada and play in front of those Canadian fans because they just love hockey so much. Um, we had a great experience when we went up to Montreal. And so I think anything in the Midwest or Canada would be really cool. Um, just anywhere where the fans will come and watch us play, really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it, obviously. I think there's a the logical tie is, uh, of course, Canada's a big market, and I think that's where there's a, a major uh, women's fan base. But when you watch the NCAA and you you look at the teams in Minnesota or or Wisconsin, there's never an empty stands. It, it's full, and uh, there's huge crowds. And uh, I think that Minnesota probably needs a tie-in over there, um, whether it's Chicago or Milwaukee or something over there that they can, you know, have another regional. Uh, rivalry formed that would be wonderful i personally i'm biased i live about an hour from detroit so i would love to see that uh, but you know all in good time i think that that would come but um callie i i thank you for joining me i don't have any more questions for you i'm excited to watch you play for the boston pride again this season uh, and I've been so excited to see the, the roster announcements that are coming. Uh, but thank you for joining me, and I wish you all the best. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was my conversation with Callie Flanagan of the Boston Pride. Next up, Lauren Gable. Let's jump right in and see what Lauren has to say about her season with the Boston Pride. Thank you for joining me, Lauren. And uh, I'm happy to have you on here to talk about the PHF, about your season, with the Boston Pride uh, and about women's hockey in general. And I'm hoping that maybe we can just start by discussing the season that you had, because obviously you were the leading scorer this season in the PHF, um, put together a really dominant campaign with Boston. Uh, of course, things didn't really go as you probably hoped in the playoffs, but uh, let's start by just telling me about your initial experience in the PHF, because this was your first season in the league. Yeah, um, well, thank you for having me first off on the this podcast. But, um, you know, the, the PHF this year was a really great experience for me. Um, Boston was super welcoming when I first got here. And um, all of my teammates are really great teammates. Um, they work hard both on and off the ice. And um, obviously the coaching staff and support staff are really great too. And, um, you know, I had my eyes set on Boston for a couple of years now since Paul had reached out to me um, for those years. And, um, finally decided to uh, come here, and I think it's been the best decision for me since. Yeah, of course, you played uh, with the PWHPA recently as well. You've, you've kind of got the experience of the whole gamut of uh, North American professional women's hockey. Um, what did you see from the PHF that made you feel like this was the time to jump? What was that decision-making process like with you? Um, was there anything that kind of just stood out in your head and was like, well, this is, this is the time I'm going. I think it's more um, structure for me. Um, and just having those regular games every weekend or every other weekend, however, the season went this year. Um, you know, I think um, like I've told everyone since I graduated school, I was missing that I was missing playing in games. Um, I'm the type of player who needs to, to play in those games to get better. Um, you can only do so much in practice and in skill sessions and stuff. And, um, you know, in order to, to see the improvements, you have to see uh, how it goes in a game. And um, that was something that I was really missing. And um, obviously the PHF has been a really great experience with that. Um, you know, 
played 24 games this year and um, had had really great structure. Um, I was on the ice every day and um, just got the opportunity um, every single chance I got to to get better. Yeah, the league is definitely improving in terms of its uh, what it can offer professional hockey players. There was a amazing announcement of the the massive salary cap increase moving forward towards next year. Um, you know, everything from health benefits to uh, expansion, the league just seems to be adding so many things that are answering the questions of critics. And one thing that I've seen a lot of in terms of critique from people has to do with fan support. And I know in Boston, you have great fan support. Maybe you could tell people who haven't got to watch a game or who might not have seen what the stands look like in Boston, what kind of, uh, what kind of support you get from fans and what you see when you're looking up uh, at the crowd that's there for the pride games. Yeah. um, I mean, for people who don't know, we do play at warrior, um, which is where the Bruins practice, but um, it's a great facility. Um, Obviously everyone, all the staff there are super great to us and um, treat us like professional athletes. Um, you know, every my first time um, I, I took the ice there for the, the home opener, um, I was obviously a little nervous, um, but it was really great to see all the, the fans in the stands supporting us and all those little girls and boys holding up signs, um, you know, for, for other players on the team. Um, it's just really great to see all the support that we get um, day in and day out from our fans. And um, obviously we, we wouldn't be where we are without their support and obviously the support of our sponsors and um, owners. Yeah. And that's a big thing as well. Of course, there's so many different facets to the growth of women's hockey. It's, it's everything from getting that fan support in the seats in arenas, uh, but sponsorship is a big thing. And I know that you've in the past uh, represented a few different brands and that seems to have been kind of the way that women's hockey players used to be able to, make a go at this and now that's changing um what do you think the salary cap increase means for women like yourself and for even the next generation you know women that are currently playing in the ncaa or u sports in canada what do you think the message is from a league like the phf to them about how valuable women's hockey is because I think it's always been devalued or placed as secondary to men's hockey, which I think is nonsense. Um, I might be still in a minority among hockey writers, but uh, I love it and I want to see more of it. So I'm, I'm wondering what you think that message is to that next wave of, of talent. Yeah, I think it's really great um, to see where the PHF was at the beginning to see where it is now. Um, Obviously, huge improvements in in every aspect, not just the money portion. Um, And, you know, we're not just doing this for us. um, We're doing it for those little girls that um, look up to us and want to be a professional hockey player one day. And, um, you know, really have to give a lot of thanks to the players who have been in the league for um, however long they have been in here. And, um, you know, we couldn't be where we are today without them and, and pushing and striving for the best for um, everyone. Yeah. For every, you know, Lauren Gable, there's a, a Jillian Dempsey and a Madison Packer and people like that, that have been around the league forever doing uh, at times, probably pay, playing for literally nothing almost, you know, not a livable wage. Everyone originally in this league uh, had to have second jobs. And, um, and I think that's a portion that, people often forget about women's hockey players is that almost everyone's coming to this league with a degree, um, with some kind of employability skills. Uh, Did you have a plan? Were you, you know, what was your, if hockey wasn't going to be the thing, where was your career path headed? Honestly, I, I don't know. Um, (laughs) I took communications, uh, majored in communications at school with a minor in business and psychology. Um, I'm actually going back to school um, in, well, the spring. Um, I'm going to be doing countering crime, um, Masters of Public Safety at Wilfrid Laurier University. So uh, I'm going to be doing that. I hope to get into um, crime analytics, you know, stuff like that. That stuff's kind of interesting to me. Um, But for right now, obviously, my focus is on hockey and 
um, pursuing um, that that goal of hopefully making the Olympic team. Yeah, so let's talk about that for a minute. That you had a, a spectacular showing, I think, in 2019, and uh, it was, uh, you know, something I think that surprised a lot of people to not see you back on that roster right away. Uh, Patty Kazmaier winner, you know, you, you you put up a great showing there. Um, and part of the thing that I like to do on this podcast is I want to talk about the human aspect of our sport and what it means, not just to go out and score goals, but the other things. And I'm wondering, maybe you can just talk us through, and I know that this is probably not your favorite topic, but what that whole process that, you know, the mental health aspect of it, of wanting to be on that team, not making it, making it, not making it, you know, and still, as you're saying now, living for the idea and the dream that you're going to be back there, um, hopefully to represent Canada at the next Olympics. Yeah, um, definitely hard. And obviously something that, um, people obviously don't want to go through in life, but you know, there's going to be ups and downs and and positives and negatives. And um, it's what you do to overcome those negatives to eventually make it a positive. Um, You know, I had a lot of fun this year with hockey and and really just focused on myself and growing both on and off the ice and um, you know, thank my teammates and coaching staff for that. But um, something that I've always gone by is prove people wrong. And I think that's, something that um, has stuck with me for, for quite some time since um, making the team and getting cut and all that stuff. But, um, you know, you're, you're only letting down yourself if you're not going to push hard and, and, you know, prove those people wrong and, and prove, prove, prove them wrong every single day, every chance you get. Well, I got to watch the, uh, the PHF quite a bit this year. I was one of the, uh, the people behind the scenes working to make the connection between the Professional Hockey Writers Association and the PHF to make the the formal relationship this year to vote for awards in the future, much like the National Hockey League and the PHWA. So many PWs and PHFs, and there's too many acronyms that have the same letters. But uh, I think that was that was an exciting moment where media are now going to focus in on the PHF and vote. Um, and I, I'm sure that. Uh, you know, when, well, I saw the announcements the the awards come out and, and your name was all over them. And I've seen you play several times, whether it be on television or, or streaming or live this year, including at the all-star game. And it's clear that there's a lot of talent uh, in this league, a lot of skill. And I don't think it gets enough credit for that because so much revolves around those 18 people that are playing um, for Team Canada right now and for Team USA right now. But we're forgetting that there's hundreds of top-level hockey players out there um, that probably, you know, well, definitely would be good enough to be on any other national team and be one of the best players out there in the world. So um, we're kind of blessed to have that large amount of, of skilled players here. But... Um, you know, we saw yourself, we got uh, Daryl Watts signed in the PHF this year. Um, I know that the PWHPA is looking to launch a league, but do you think that as women in the NCAA see people like yourself, like, uh, you know, Brittany Howard, uh, Daryl Watts, these young, talented players, uh, you know, Jaguar, all these people that are coming around, Uh, and joining the PHF, do you think that there's going to continue to be an influx of talent into the league that's going to uh, make it even more marketable, make it even more exciting for uh, people who might not watch women's hockey on a regular basis like I do? Yeah, I think um, there's going to be a lot of talent coming in, um, especially with the increase in salary cap. Um, You know, everything's trying to be more professional with our league. And um, I think that draws a lot of attention to um, all of our teams. Um, you know, I think with the Howards and Watts, Jaguar and me, um, you know, there's obviously other players that I could mention, but um, that's just a little bit of talent with us. And, um, you know, if we can draw any, any, any other talent to our league, I think it's, it'll be huge for us. And um, obviously this year we've had a lot of um, Czechia, 
players um, join our league or have played in the league for a little bit. And um, it's really great to see because um, it's not just Canada and U.S., it's um, players from, from different countries. And um, we're just trying to grow the game and, and do that together. Thanks for joining me again for another episode of Line Change. I'm your host, Ian Kennedy, and today we were joined for a double dose by Lauren Gable and Callie Flanagan of the Boston Pride. I hope you learned something about women's hockey. It's such an incredible time to be a fan of the sport. Until next time, this was a line change.